Several of our judges here. Hi, Shaq. Hi, is, is Miss Francisca here? Hi. Hi, team. Hi, guys. Hi, yes, I'm here. Hello. Hi, how are you guys doing? And how was the session? It was really interesting. I, yeah. I enjoyed every topic. You know, everyone had very different perspective, right, Shaq? <laughs> <laughs> it was yeah. so difficult to put a score, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Especially the last, the last one was quite interesting, yeah, because everyone yeah. Was, was telling not to find, not to find, but it's good to have uh, opposing views. Then mm -hmm. that's where it becomes interesting, right? Yeah. Okay. That's that's exactly what we want to hear. Thank you so so much. Uh, first yeah. of all, thank you for being a judge. We definitely appreciate your presence today, and I'm push, I, and, I, and I'm hundred percent again sure our participants did as well. Uh, so right now, uh, the breakout rooms should be, all the breakout rooms should be coming in in a few minutes. And after that, we will be having a photography session. So do you guys mind waiting just for a couple of minutes to take pictures? Sure. Okay, thank you. Nine. Hi, Miss Maya, I think you're here. And uh, yes, please. And where's Miss Yasmin? Miss Yasmin right here. Now. Do my answer. 
Hi, Ms. Maya, how are you? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Hi. Hi. <laughs> how was the session for you? It was great. Um, we had a really fruitful discussion on risk of pregnancy. Um, yeah. <laughs> we had a, a medic student in the group and that was very insightful, yeah. Awesome, that's always fun, right? I think yes. Okay. <laughs> All right. So right now we're just waiting for the other breakout rooms to come back in uh, for a photography session. So I really hope you don't mind just waiting for a couple of minutes uh, for the breakout rooms to come in. Arisha, uh, if you don't mind, since we are waiting anyway, uh, would, would we be able to know like the participants, uh, what are their course of studies and uh, what interests them to join the, the session today and yesterday? I thought it's interesting to have a bit of that interaction since, you know, we've only had very short time with them. Yes. Uh, do you have a specific person you want to ask? Uh, no, maybe just uh, where are they from and uh, what are their studies and, you know, a little bit about why they have also joined the session. Okay. Uh, does anybody here wants to volunteer first? I can do. Okay, go ahead, Fadila. Right. Hi. Uh, so I'm fellow Fanyasra Fendi. I'm currently, okay, I'm actually going for third year this September in applied psychology and management. So basically, it's uh, it's a double major, psychology and also business. And why I'm really interested to join GLC is because I found that, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Ezra. Yeah, I found that um, it's really interesting, and not just because of the itinerary itself, like from the uh, judges, speakers, like they are from amazing background you know so that's why it really interests me to join with this program and thank you so much for the opportunity msga um kida uh you saw who came in right okay is she a sign i'm so sorry okay so thank you so much farila i think i also want to uh ask somebody that's from a different group so we're in group 12. Why don't we go for group one? Anybody in group one that wants to uh, introduce? Oh, okay, I see, La Daniel. Go ahead, La Daniel. Sorry, uh, uh, oh no, is my mic on? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> so the question is um, from where uh, are we from, right? Like uh, what we're doing and stuff. So <laughs> for our group, I think what the um, organizers have done well is that they've made i am i'm assuming each group very diverse so for example my group i'm doing business and then there's another person in our group doing law another person doing engineering another person doing political science so it's a very diverse group so i'm assuming all the other groups as well they've taken from different uh, courses and um, i think it's very well done as well because it brings about very synergistic kind of collaboration where we get points from different people and we can you know construct a very uh, well balanced presentation Thank you. Awesome. All right. Uh, group three, Fatin, go ahead. Mm, hello, everyone. So my name is Fatin Adia. I'm currently studying in France and under the course of business management, in global business management. So the reason that I applied for uh, MSDA program is because, um, you know, uh, based on its past reputation, I thought that, that the invited judges and speakers will be like very repeatable and the progress will be very insightful and very engaging. And I wasn't wrong about that. It was a very fruitful session. I, I love it. I totally enjoyed the pitching session just now. I enjoyed it the most actually, especially the discussion that we had, we had uh, the personal one, late night and so on. It was interesting to hear everyone's opinion and go back and forth and everything. I mean, due to the COVID situation these days, we had little uh, interaction. So to have argument and debate session like that, it was quite rare and very satisfying. Thank you so much. All right, uh, group five, Dan, go ahead. Hello, nice to meet everyone. Um, my name is Dan. Hi, Jess. 
<laughs> Sorry for eating. I had to take medication. But um, I just graduated with a Bachelor of Arts in um, History and International Affairs from Boston. Um, I joined this um, because I've always been quite interested in policymaking. That's why I went into the field that I went into. Um, and I wanted to basically get a range of opinions and understanding of one topic because it's very easy to kind of get stuck in your own bubble. And that has always been what I was really afraid of um, is that I would just be in an echo chamber of people who agree with me and I want to learn more. So thank you to both the judges <laughs> so much for you know giving us really great feedback. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, group seven, Lim Yen. Hey there, uh, I'm Yen Li, you can call me Alicia too. I'm currently studying in Beijing, China. Like, uh, what I'm joining here is I simply saw uh, something about JLC in my um, student concert group. And then I was a Queen's Guide before. Yeah, so yeah, I really like enjoy joining camps like, you know, in multi-racials and yeah. And I want to promote my group, which is Group 7. And we have a name of, of food, which is Fadas Gila. And we are all four girls. So yeah, we are all spicy girls. And yeah, the QR code that they made, like, yeah, it's really interesting. And wow, they, they sent me that because I got my vaccine just now and I slept earlier last night. So my girls did that. So I really proud of them. And yes, I really enjoy the pitching competition and all the workshops that I have yesterday. And yes, thank you for that. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alicia, uh, for the introduction. Uh, so before, <laughs> before we uh, move on for a moment, uh, so every breakout room should be here. But I am not seeing Judge John Lim and Professor Ruben. So I think while we wait for them, can I have someone from group four? Um, yeah, I was about to volunteer actually. Oh, okay. <laughs> Good timing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi everyone, my name is Jess Britt, but you can call me Jess for short. Um, I'm currently in my third year of chemical engineering and um, I think, actually, I didn't know there was GLC. I know MSG existed, but I didn't know there was this GLC thing until we got an invite under my organization. And, and I think um, my favorite part was, of course, uh, the keynote speaker today, later on, which is uh, YB Yobin. I look up to her because I'm really into um, environmental projects and sustainability, right? So that was like one of the main passion. I was like, oh my God, finally, I get to hear my idol speaking. And uh, other than that, I think the key takeaway that I have learned from this experience is the networking you do with all the other elite minds from different, different um, organizations to see how they think and um, the skills that they provide to your team, right? So this is not the end of our um, relationship that we build in these two days, you know. Um, this platform has given us a chance to connect more and work more in the future projects that we have. And if we ever need like support among us youths, this is how we start. So this is why I'm really thankful for GLC to um, MSGA, especially for putting it, putting all the elite youths together, working on a case study and building a really good uh, relationship together. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Jess. Yes, like Chris said, really well said. Thank you so, so much. Um, so let's, okay, we're gonna move on. Okay, I think every of our judges here. Hello, Professor Ruben. Hello, Mr. John Lim, are you here? Yep, hello. I'm here. Oh, awesome, all right. Uh, so we are going to start our photography session now. So uh, go ahead and unshare the screen, uh, host. Okay, I think we're missing. Yes, okay. So for our participants, go ahead and turn on your cameras, prepare your beautiful and handsome faces. We'll be taking the pictures very soon. Just give me the cue, okay? All right, I think all six is here. 
Uh, is Miss Yasmin not here? Okay, I'm missing She had another stuff to do, so she cannot stay here okay. after one. All right. Yeah. Got it. Thank you so much. Okay, we will start our uh, photography session now. Okay, All right. Everybody, three, two, one, smile. Okay, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to take a gallery view as well. Okay, again, first, first group, smile. Second group, smile again. Third group, smile again. And then lastly, all right. Okay, again, okay, thank you so much to all of our judges today for your presence and for judging, obviously, the future of um, Malaysian leaders. Uh, we're at MSJ are very honored to have you guys here today and also for our speakers yesterday. Thank you, thank you so, so much. Uh, if you guys do want to join in for uh, YB Yobian's uh, session, it will be after this at 2.15. Uh, and our closing ceremony will be at 2.45. So for now, until 2.15, uh, just uh, to our participants and to our judges, go ahead and uh, have a little bit of break uh, and come back for 2.15 uh, for y uh, YB Yobian's session. Thank you so much, Miss Felicia. See you soon. See ya. Take care. Bye bye. 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 All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Peter. You have been such an amazing judge. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good day. Thank you. Awesome. Keep in touch. Bye-bye. All right, I think I got the cue to start. Uh, Wabi, you'll be in session. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for our pitching competition just now and to all of our participants. So for without further ado, for our closing keynote speaker, please welcome Yang Berhormat Yo Bin, Member of Parliament for Bakri, and our moderator, Mr. Mina Kauji. Welcome. Hi. Thank you so much for that introduction, Arisha. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome back. Um, and we hope you enjoyed um, the old sessions beforehand. Thank you for joining us over the last two days. And also quickly, we've now come to the closing keynote session of MSGA Global Leadership Camp 2021 with none other than YB Yobi Yin. Hi, YB. Good afternoon. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. I'm good. All right, it's so excellent to have you with us. Thank you so much for making time out of your busy schedule. So basically in this session, everybody, to all our attendees, we expect that you will have lots of questions for YB. We will keep those for the end of the session, the last 15 or so minutes. We've got a Slido link that we are dropping into the chat box. Please um, key in all your questions throughout. Kindly keep the comments not just respectful, but also on topic. And remember, today we're talking all about why leadership is essential for achieving sustainable development goals. Right, YB, so let's get started uh, with a little bit of how things are in Bakri at the moment, all with the ongoing lockdown, and of course you at the helm of everything, overseeing things, how are, what's the situation right, like right now? Um, right now I'm in my Bakri office. Hi, hi everyone first. Hi everyone, uh, I'm in my Bakri office. We were just finished, uh, 
we just, I just finished uh, distribute some food items to the taxi drivers, to the to the the school transporters that have no income for the past like one and a half month, and and then we also met with SMEs that cannot start their business. Things are very very tough. Uh, I think uh, I think most of the people would know uh, on the ground things are very tough with the closed economy. Uh, six already forty over days. Uh, people are closed at home. A lot of people lost their wages, and we have actually done a survey in around in uh, in this particular area on uh, what about the salaries are given by the companies and a lot of companies that actually did not. Uh, did not open during the MCO period. They have resort to resorted to cut the salaries by half, some twenty five percent, some no pay, and a lot of uh, migrant workers. Even worse, they don't get salaries. They only get food. That means you can only survive, and you cannot work. So that is uh, what is happening on the ground. And the vaccination is also come coming uh, quite late in in Johor. Johor is the third last vaccination and uh, so it gives a lot of pressure to the owners uh, uh, business owners as well as people who actually work um, so we, we that that is something on the ground but we are keeping our hope high on vaccination and hopefully in July and August things will get better and Johor will open up for will be going to fasa dua phase two of uh, this uh, national recovery plan uh, Two weeks later so we are also preparing uh, with the uh, business owners those who need to do tests how do we come together and then to do doing tests at the at the lower price so these are some some of the things that are happening i i think it's happening everywhere in, in malaysia yeah absolutely happening everywhere yb and you know we wish you and your entire team who are working tirelessly um all the courage in the world but now let's take a small step back from what's happening on the ground right now and um, spread the net a little bit wider, talking about sustainability, talking about leadership, and um, going back, taking a step back into a past couple of years where you were also, of course, our most recent Malaysian Minister of Energy, Technology, Science, Environment, and Climate Change. Tell us a little bit about why um, this was not only your mandate while you were in the ruling government, but at the same time, this was something you passionately advocated for, got results for, including 3,000 tons of plastic waste that were sent back to countries of origin. Yeah, um, I think um, a lot of time, uh, for me, I'm very passionate. I am just, I, actually, I thought, I, I think I'm a very lucky person. I'm actually by already very passionate about climate change, about environment, about energy policy. Um, what when I was a law, just a lawmaker or just an adun, you know, but I was very, very fortunate that eventually I get this portfolio that I'm very passionate about. So, so um, I'm now writing a book. The book is too long already. So, so I need to cut, otherwise it will become a thesis. So, so I'm writing a book on the policies that's involved and the policies that we have changed and the policies that is, uh, that we, I hope to see in the future on, uh, on energy policy, on, um, on uh, the environment policy, as well as on science and science governance, science and tech governance policies. I hope that, um, I think with all the, uh, I think as a leader, as a, as a leader, there are two things we need to think about. One is, what is the immediate thing that you can do to make an impact? What is the immediate thing with the power that you have to make a quick impact, something that you can, but you can, you have also to have a plan for medium term and long term. So medium and long term will cover policies issues. So those are the ones that some of those I have not been able to finish doing while I'm in office because I was only in office for 20 months. So I hope that I could write the book and then not to say that next time I will go back, but to hopefully that somebody will read it and then to be inspired because ideas and visions are very important as a leader. As in what you want to see in the future and that Future, what you want to see is a direction, but it also needs to have a lot of meat. That means it has a lot of substance. You say, I want to be a sustainable green Malaysia, everyone can say it, right? So how you want to define it and how you want to get there, those are those are those things that I think uh, will, will, will be needed in, in, in a leadership. A vision, a plan, and something that's very logical for immediate and hopefully in the future, like medium and long term. 
Yeah, absolutely, YB. Uh, I, I can personally say that I can't wait for your book to come out. No problem if it's a huge thesis, but we all want to read your thoughts. And especially when it comes to <laughs> it's planning. A long, and <laughs> technical. I, I, I'm just trying to cut down. I'm trying to cut. I'm really trying to cut. So, so I hope that it's not a thesis because the mm. moment you make it like a textbook, as a leader as well, the, um, there are things that you should say uh, to a certain audience. There are things that you should say to another type of audience. I hope that the book can be read by people or, or I mean, even not a book, like in your, our daily communication, we must be able to communicate complicated idea uh, that is in very simple term, that is in, you know, uh, a layman language, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to roadmap, speaking of roadmap, let's talk a little bit about leadership, especially when it comes to female leadership and how there still is a dearth of that, of course, in Malaysian parliament and some of the challenges that you personally face and how you overcame them to ensure that your path was a little clearer. Yeah, um, I think uh, not only in parliament, I think in, uh, in even in the corporate world, uh, in Asian country, you will still face with people who think that, you know, you are a woman, um, especially when you are pregnant, then, then, you know, when you go for a job interview or whatever, people will just say, ah, I need to give you three months of maternity leave and all this uh, all these things. So, so we do have, I will say that this is a very general uh, it's a very, very general uh, uh, problem that is faced by uh, people around uh, in the corporate world. And today, if you see that uh, the women leader like uh, rising up, uh, it's not only limited to, to parliament, but also in the corporate world that we are not seeing enough uh, women uh, that, that will, are given a chance to, to be at the leadership role. But I think for the past 10 uh, for the past 10 years, things have changed. In parliament, unfortunately, we are still at 10%. We are like minority 10%. Female is 10% of us. And then the young female is even worse. Young people, like, um, so so the parliament wasn't open uh, for one of the excuses given by the government is more than half of our, uh, no, more than a hundred of our member of parliament is 60 years old and above. So it is yeah. not only about female, it's really diversity in leadership. So we need a sure. diversity in leadership, not only in, in the parliament, but also in other places. So how do I overcome? Uh, you cannot overcome it by just talking. So, so a, lot of people will, uh, a lot of people will say, oh, let's have a campaign to ask for more women in uh, parliament and then more uh, that you all can mm -hmm. give us a... Well, so while we need to do that, I think one of the most practical thing for female leaders to advocate for female leadership is to be able to be a good leader. So the moment we are a good leader, people will say, hey, Women leaders are like that. We should have more women leaders because uh, yeah. women leaders are, are, are like, like this. So, so being a good example, being able to deliver real action. I think those are my first priority. Of course, I will continue to speak. I think, uh, I think the, the parliament still needs a lot of women. So Absolutely. I couldn't younger agree more. Women, younger women as well, younger, younger men women, as well. Younger men, we need a diversity. Now they are all old men, just old men, 60 years old and above. They are all, and uh, of course, all are also good. So we just need diversity, not all of them. So, so we have a different, uh, uh, different uh, perspectives of things that we can actually really represent the people. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Now let's move a little bit deeper into um, COVID management and looking further global examples, right? We've actually seen lots of um, positive global examples. At first it was anecdotal, but now research is actually backing up and proving that countries with not only female leadership, but better gender equity in their parliaments have actually performed much better in managing COVID. Now, are there any hallmarks of female leadership or more gender equitable leadership that you feel have maybe contributed to better COVID management? Um, I think one of the threat that uh, for most women are empathy. Like, of course, mm -hmm. men also has empathy, but women, yes. women has very, very natural empathy. You, uh, when we watch movie, we cry. You know, when we, you know, when we see people. So, uh, the the sensitivity to the to the needs of the people, I think that is one of the nature of, of, of 
women. But of course, women also have other weaknesses that men can cover. That's why I, I always say that it is not like you, you need to have women. You need to really have a diverse group of people. Um, so you can, but I, it is unfair to say only the, 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 the countries with female leaders are, are, are performing well. There are countries that are with mostly men also performing quite well. Like for example, in China, China, really their female leadership is very few, but they are really performing Super very small, well. yes, yes. Uh, yeah. Um, and they are performing very well because of science-based very, very detailed, very disciplined, and you know, you don't leave anything to chance. You analyze everything. They are very, very science-based. Whereas for us, it is different. Maybe we're a tropical country, so we will we will be more laid back in the way it's managed. So it's not science-based, not precise, not data-driven. So those are the things that drive to the, the, the difference in uh, performance in COVID uh, control, I think. Yeah, absolutely. YB, from there, I'm going into um, a little bit deeper even into COVID and also because you mentioned environment sustainability again. Now, COVID, um, as um, what has been stained by scientific labs and research around the world, it is possibly going to be only the first wave of such more pandemics to come in the near future, right? together with the global climate crisis, it's no longer just climate change. Yeah. How do you see that being even more important a factor in governments around the world needing to be more sustainable? It's no longer actually a choice, right? If you yeah. want to not just survive, but you want to what is best for all of your citizens, you actually do have to get on board with sustainability. Yeah, um, so, so um, this one is more on sustainability in terms of resilience, like country mm -hmm. resilience towards crisis. Um, so what COVID-19 has shown us is that uh, most of the countries are not prepared for crisis. Uh, most That's of right. the country, like when the crisis hit, then, then they, they have this. So I think after th this pandemic, more countries will be more prepared for uh, disease, uh, infectious disease crisis. But climate crises uh, that are coming, there are different, different types of climate crisis. And some climate crisis comes slowly. That means it's not, it doesn't look like a disaster, like pandemic, like, but it is mm -hmm. a long-term thing. Uh, but yeah. there, are, there are some that will be a, like, it's a, it's a irreversible change. For example, I give an example. Um, it, sure. You need to reach a tipping point uh, for something to happen, uh, for example, a glacier. Uh, let's say we, we have a broken gl glacier, right? So you need yep. to about like four Celsius increase for for a big big glacier to fall and then to actually immediately raise the uh, uh, ocean level to very very high. Otherwise, climate yep. change will give a gradual increase in the uh, mean sea level. So they are also uh, of temperature, let's say for example, ocean temperature in terms of acidification of oceans. Mm -hmm. so also at the time where there is this equilibrium, the temperature where it will change the entire equilibrium into a new uh, new normal. So, so that yep. is when you would have sort of, you will see a crisis. So climate crisis is more on, there is a gradual one, and there is something that you hit certain point, then you, you will get an irreversible change to a new equi equilibrium. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, and I think but, we've been seeing... Uh, so so pandemic, this pandemic actually remind a lot of people on how do we prepare, not only for mm. pandemic, and also for climate crisis that is coming. Exactly. And I think even in Malaysia, locally, we have so many examples, right? For example, the um, traditional monsoon season flash floods, yeah. they have been getting worse every decade. Yeah. And sometimes even in the past five years, we've actually seen a huge escalation, especially in the East Coast. And even in your time in office, the floods were getting worse each yeah. year. And at the same time, if you do not have sustainable leadership on the ground, that can actually translate into families living in shelters rather than having their um, homes rebuilt within the appropriate amount of time. Your comments on this? Yeah. So a lot of people will think flood is mm. caused by climate change. Actually, flood can be caused by clock drain as well. So, right. so, so, so. Very complicated. Flood, yeah, very, it's a very, very complicated because climate is about climate and a flood, monsoon, uh, it can be actually a natural thing that happen. But no matter what you do as a country, you cannot reverse that. As in, you cannot yeah. 
because it is a global thing. That means, let's say, for example, why not? Why why do we need to cut carbon? Let, let's say, for example, yeah, you cut sure, carbon, sure. you will not reduce your flood. So you cut you cut carbon together with other countries. All of us together will reduce uh, our our frequency of extreme weather. It doesn't mean that it won't have extreme weather, but it will only mean that it will have less of the frequency at, compared to business as usual. Because in, in, in the world, there is this carbon cycle as well. That means even on the natural thing, you would also have a, a natural uh, monsoon and a natural rise of temperature according to the carbon cycle, a, a, a natural carbon cycle. So what we do is that, what we, how do we prevent the artificial ones to go beyond our control? That is one. So, so that means uh, the correlation with how we cut carbon is not mm -hmm. correlated to how many flood we will have, but how many flood we will have can be prepared through better infrastructure. That means That's you right. not only have an environment minister come on board, you should have the work minister come on board, you, work ministry come on board, you should have the local government come on board on, on a building uh, plan, and you should have everyone come on board to make sure your infrastructure is resilient to different types of weather. So for example, if some of you are, are, are uh, engineers here, you would, uh, mm -hmm. civil engineers for example, you would design, let's say you design a monsoon drain, you design a monsoon drain based on one in a hundred years frequency. That means yeah. monsoon drain, one is built, uh, one hundred years it will have no rain, and then one year it will have it, it will rain. Uh -huh. But then unfortunately, yeah. uh, most of our engineers uh, will find out that whatever monsoon drain you base on, and with the weather and with the change of raining pattern, that means uh, mm -hmm. today you put here the monsoon drain for this. Uh, rain intensity, but tomorrow, because of a changing of rain pattern, the thing goes to the other side. So the exactly. question right now for engineers is that, how do we design something that is resilient towards that a uh, changing mm. rain pattern in our infrastructure? Not only on monsoon drain, Slango, if you are staying in Klang Valley, you will have problem with raw water. Why? Mm -hmm. There was one, one time, I think 2014, that was the real impact of changing rain pattern. What happened was that because we built our reservoir at certain location, because there used to be right. rain there. But then that year, it did not rain there. It rained somewhere else. So eventually we did not, we were not able to catch enough water through our reservoir that is at that fixed location. Mm that for the past 20 years have been raining, but this year they rain in other places because of changing rain. Gosh. So, so now uh, the Solano government, they have started to do a horas. Horas is a high, it's a very technical thing. So the, it means sure. more reservoir along the river. So that, okay, if it doesn't rain here, at least this reservoir will get it, this reservoir will get it, this reservoir will get it. So, so in your infrastructure, not only on uh, flood, but on anything that's related to water, this thing will come. A, the, a changing rain pattern is one of the most important uh, thing that the country needs to think about in terms of infrastructure. And, uh, but this is not in my previous portfolio, but I think it's very important for adaptation. Absolutely. But I think the example that you gave us, YB, is, is so, it, it hits real hard because it tells us about how if you're not intuitive, if you're not collaborating intra-ministry, intra-agency, you could spend millions, hundreds of millions even, yep. and it will be raining somewhere else. Yes. You know? Yeah. Yes. I think that's a, uh, that is a perfect, um, quite, quite hard nutshell, you know? So from there, YB, I also wanted to ask you a little bit more about when it goes into um, executing sustainability in general, what have been some of the challenges in Malaysia in getting the big corporations on board, right? Because of course, it's very important for each one of us to be environmentally conscious, work towards sustainability in all aspects of life. But the truth of the matter is when it comes to environment, about 70, 80% of emissions still go on the top 20, top 30 companies in the world. 
Um, so in the world itself, there is this movement uh, called RE100, Renewable Energy 100. It is That's by right. the uh, big corporates that come together. It includes Google, Apple, uh, 3M, Adobe, every big companies, most of the big companies actually are in it. That means um, they actually fix an, uh, a goal of 2050 goal where you, you, would, uh, you would actually mm. uh, will have to get all your electricity 100% yeah. by 2050, that is latest. That means you need to set a target before 2050 or latest by 2050 to go 100% renewable. So now mm -hmm. there, is a, there is also a movement among RE100 companies or those outside to say not only we need to have a zero carbon, uh, net carbon, uh, zero, uh, net zero carbon uh, uh, target, Output. but we yeah. also want our global supply chain to do it. That means, mm. let's say for example, if Malaysia is one part of their global supply chain, that's right. You have to also fit to their carbon goal. So if you do cannot change your process uh, by fitting to their carbon goal, then you would stand a risk to lose the business. So I recently sent a charter bank just uh, uh, I released a, a, a report on uh, it's called Carbon Date on uh, it studies twelve. Uh, countries around the world, including Malaysia, uh, that mm -hmm. is very heavily involved in global supply chain and see what are the yeah. opportunities or, or risks uh, uh, regarding big companies wanting to have net zero carbon by certain time. So in Malaysia, we stand to gain or lose about 65 billion US dollars. Wow. 200. Wow. 200 over billion, which is about 20% of our GDP, if we can or cannot, depending whether mm. we can actually meet their zero, uh, net zero carbon. So a lot of people, are, when, whenever we talk about sustainability, one of the challenges is, uh, I think corporates don't have a problem because most of their clients right now are really into this. Many of Correct. them, especially those in the global, global supply chain. Uh, of course, SMEs, they are not so much. But what our main challenge is that the government, the government always think that environment is about spending more money and economic sacrifice. We need to, mm. we need to feed the, uh, have a bread and butter issue than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than, than saving an environment. environment. Yeah. It's not true. Yeah. Actually, mm -hmm. environment, you can create green jobs. I, I, I can talk very long about green jobs on how we actually Absolutely. actually how we can we create green jobs with our new target of 20% renewable energy, how we actually attract investment with that, how green industry can grow with your green target, and 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 that is a new jobs and a better jobs for the people. And and that also view yourself as in a global supply chain. So there is a lot to gain in green agenda. But the problem right now we have is how do we change the people and the mindset of the leaders? I tell you an example, a very, very sure. simple example. Uh, in budget 2021, so although we were opposition, so we were trying to talk to the government and we talked to one of the senior leaders. I don't want to bash anybody. Lah. We want to talk to one of the ministers. So sure. I asked uh, my friend to, you know, send my send my, mm -hmm. send, uh, my writing to him to tell him about, oh, so it's a him, right. to tell him about green recovery. How in the COVID situation with government, mm -hmm stimulus package, you can actually have a green recovery. So I write down Very all cool. the policies that he can change, all mm -hmm. the number of point jobs. By point by point. Point by yeah. point, everything. So the yeah, moment yeah. we submit to, to him, you know what he said? He said, this stimulus package is to save the people and not saving the monkeys. Wow. Well, um, people, monkeys, it's all part of one system. So, and, and he cannot jow that actually sustainability wow. and green going green are actually having economic benefits and you can create green jobs. So I have written there how uh, we create renewable energy jobs through some of uh, the policies we implemented uh, during our time and, and that how many jobs created. And if you can actually follow this, you, this is what you will get. And, and if you can expand, this is what you will get, even with the detail of how much you need to do. So, but then if the whole pages just gone of the mindset that, hey, sustainability is yeah. money. So that will be a challenge. So a challenge to change 
the mindset of uh, people who make decisions. Exactly. Thank you so much for that, YB. I think that was such an important example because it showcases why it is that leaders don't just need to be there, but also have a sustainable mindset when it comes to policy making for everything, not just for the environment. The environment doesn't yes. sit there in a little yeah. glass jar. We are part of it. Yeah. You know, we live within it. So YB, I have plenty more questions for you, but seeing as in we've got so many questions from our attendees who are also very excited to speak to you and get some opinions from you, I think we can actually segue into the audience Q&A session now. We, what we'll do is we'll take the upvoted questions from the Slido link. Um, the top rated one so far, we've got about 20 questions. Why we will go through as many as we can. Uh, the first one is what advice would you give to young, passionate females, women who would like to make an impact on our environment to join politics, right? Marrying together politics and environment for women. Um, okay, what actually, what does the question ask? What advice? I, I think that, yeah, I think the question wants to ask if you are a woman who's passionate about the environment, what okay. is a good way to make that part of your agenda when you join politics? Okay. All right. Um, so unfortunately, I, I need to be like very frank to all of you. Um, please, please. Um, unfortunately, like because environment is such an issue that I think only the only the young people are passionate about. So if you talk to young people, you talk to more educated, uh, those uh, who have, have more exposure, they will tell you environment is important. Um, and it's, it is on top of their voting uh, priority. But if you ask about most of the people on the street, actually Malaysia, because it's a developing country and you cannot blame people for it. Most of the people concerned about the next meal on the table. They're concerned about basic education for their children. They're concerned about basic healthcare. That is also uh, sustainability to, uh, uh, it's- Yeah, the, to be honest, yeah. yeah it's an SDG. But environment uh, is not something that many, many people will put their priority on. Of course, they will think that it's important, but their vote will go to those people who, uh, who will give them better economic policy, for example, who will best protect their right, uh, who, who all this, right? So, so because actually Orang Asli, um, Orang Asli, Orang Asal, they have a very, very strong passion about environment because they live very close to it. But if you That's ask right. them, uh, so food more important or environment mm -hmm. more important, they will, they probably many of them, or I cannot say all of them, a big number will say food is more, most, most important and jobs are more important. So, so, so that is what we are today. So across the world, you can on, also see only the developed country, they are, mm -hmm. they are, they are, their citizens have enough to eat and then enough of uh, uh, education, enough good education for good jobs and everything. Then, you know, uh, they are more aware or, or they will demand more of environment. And even that environment or Green Party or people who just stand for environment in an election uh, may still not win election. So, to, to, That's right. to, yeah. so, so what I want to say is this, is that if you are passionate about environment uh, in politics, um, politics can be a platform for you to make a change in environment, but politics is more than just environment in Malaysia context, because Malaysia have many, many basic problems that we need to solve. We really have deteriorating education. We really have, um, Absolutely. those things are very, very needed by people, like by immediate needs of the people. As a leader, we must always, always, always be aware of what people need and what people need now. And that to be say, how can we make a difference in their, what they need now before we say we make what they, their children need. Of course, we will mm -hmm. also have to prepare for what their children need. So, so these are just uh, my <laughs> by my very, very frank and honest answer to you. That is, that yeah. if you want to join politics, you need to go beyond environment and not, don't forget environment as what part of your, part of your political goal, part of your agenda in politics, but, but don't just stick to, to it only. Yeah. 
Exactly. But I think YB, you gave us some great tips a little bit earlier where you said that you can actually integrate um, environmental goals together with people's um, livelihoods yeah. in a good way. You yeah. can actually bring it all and make it happen together, but there needs to be communication, there needs to be intra-agency collaboration and understanding that the environment is not just goal number 20. It yeah. should be up there. Yeah. yeah. All right. So from there, we move into the next question that is top voted. Um, YB, this one is asking, what is your opinion, YB, on the stance diversity is credibility or leadership in representing people? Does diversity always lead to credibility or is it more important to have uh, leaders uh, regardless of their background? Yeah, um, um, I, I also want to be honest on this. Yeah, um, Actually, uh, we cannot elect somebody just because that person is a female. We cannot elect a person just because that person is a young person. We also yes. see a lot of female leaders that are not good. We also see a lot of young people who are not good. So, so leadership and, uh, and, and especially on re representing people, um, I have seen many, many politicians. I've seen every politicians, big politicians in, in, in Malaysia. Um, I, so many of them, I have worked with them. Uh, I come to realize that uh, they are good and bad in most of them. Um, and some of them are unfairly, uh, unfairly painted as too bad. Some of them, them are mm. unfairly painted as too good. But in any case, uh, I found out that there are many smart people, but there, we really lack people who have uh, the heart at the right place. So I think as a leader, the most important thing ever, ever as a leader, whether it is in politics or anything, is integrity, is honor, mm -hmm. is the will to do what is right. That is most important. Moral leadership is what is like in this country. Uh, to do what is right. But to do what is right um, is not always popular. So, so, Absolutely. So, so, so that is why you see right now what we have is people want to be popular and doing things that is not right. Um, so so the, the short answer to this is that uh, whatever thread that you are looking, of course, we need more diversity. But when you mm -hmm. look for women leaders, you need women leaders with integrity. When you look for young women, uh, young people, you need young people with integrity. And of course, hard work, uh, those diligence and all that. And if you look for minority, like the Orang Asa, Orang Asli community, you need those with integrity who will, who will speak for the people, who will represent the people and not out there because I'm a female, I get a seat, therefore I get my position and nothing else. So with great power come great responsibility. So, and remember <laughs> that. We really hope that we have more of these people that represent us in the parliament. Absolutely. Perfectly put, YB. Perfectly put. Um, from there, the next question is asking, YB, can you provide some concrete advice for young people, YB, who are interested to get in politics? What are two or three practical things young people should do in their 20s if they're interested in a sustainable political career or campaign? Okay, first of all, you need to know, uh, one is that if you want to join politics, politics have frontline or, uh, or not frontline. That means not everyone- Barisan hadapan lah. <laughs> so not, not everyone can want to be elected. Ma. Yeah. First, as a public figure, there is a lot of things you can do, I don't know. Hannah, I was just in a forum with Hannah. Hannah was saying that, you know, um, you know, when you are young, you, know, you get elected, you cannot even go to cinema. And then when you go to cinema, you meet your voters, they will say, hey, why, why you're so free? You never work for me. You know, but you are also watching yeah. movie, you know, you're asking me why am I watching movie, you know. So, so there is a lot of this. So, so you have a lot of freedom you, you don't yeah. have. And also because there is um, increased competition among young people to be Wakil Rakyat, to be frank, uh, during our time, sure. uh, the party also don't have many choice. They will <laughs> pick whoever that is willing. So those of us who are really uh, very, uh, very naive that time, uh, we believe, uh, you know, we, we went and do it. Now it's different. Now there are a lot of people, a lot of choice, a, a big competitions among people to be in the right. party 
to to because you need your party to select you to be candidate. So like the exactly. DAP, we will mostly have thirty percent of candidates that is forty years old and below. Uh, so from the one hundred and forty Wakil Rakyat that we have right now, we have more than forty of them are forty years old and below when they are elected. So so every every election we will retire some and then we will get some. Uh, young mm. people. But what I'm seeing is this trend that there is increased competition among the pool that we select for for that. So so when you want to join politics, one thing is that you are joining politics not for you to be a YB because mo most of the time and, and it is very uh, this is a very political reality yeah, that it, it gets sure. her to be a YB so so you must say that okay I join politics not because of this position I want I join politics because I want to make a difference in this country so then you join the political party that you want so so first thing get your heart right so I'm joining not because I want to be a YB I want to make a change I want to use myself I want to contribute Number two is what political party. So you can you can just mm. go, you there is no right and wrong. I always feel that uh, Malaysian uh, likes to paint their enemies as wrong and then us as right and all this. Eventually, uh, I think there is no right and wrong for your personal conviction. But most important is that you must look into different parties that have a different goal. Uh, like for example, DAP is a social democratic party and a very, very ideological and and the other parties may not have so much ideologies and all that. And then you have to see their leaders, whether they follow or not those ideology or those uh, mission and uh, they, they set out to do. So, so then you select a political parties and then you join, you, you go to the branch and all that. So, so those are some of the things that is needed for you to do. Uh, you need to first know which party you want to, to, to join. Yeah. Right? And then after that, how do you prepare yourself? Actually, um, it can, there mentally, no emotionally. <laughs> yeah, there is no preparation because you do not know what are you going to be. Uh, again, it's not like everyone who joined politics will be a YB, right? So, so exactly. when you go there, then you realize, oh, the party actually needs this. Oh, I have this expertise. I can gather people. So one of the things that are most important in, in politics is really a, a skill to organize because we need to organize many things. Huh? Campaign, you know, even uh, our bakku makanan or whatever. So we need to organize many things. So so if you want to volunteer, you have to start volunteering. Once you join, start volunteer in uh, branches or in uh, in in any uh, member of parliament's office mm -hmm. office. Then you see. So they will have many many things for you to do. One. So you will organize programs, this and that. Then you will realize, oh, these are the things that is on the ground. And of course, if you're passionate about policy, then you can actually look into policy and politics. But then you will realize that in real politics, uh, uh, more than half your time is for retail politics. That means you go shake hands, carry baby, put a dance and that. And then like uh, even for, for electric reps, you will mm -hmm. spend about 20, 30%. That is That's maximum right. to think about policy. But of course, like people, uh, different people like I'm very, very passionate about policies because I always believe that policies can change people beyond your term. That means if I put a right policy, even if I'm not there yes. anymore, the thing is going to change. So, so that's why I'm very, very passionate and I really look into detail. But there are some people that, that don't. So, but if you want to prepare yourself, read into different types of policies that that that, but also look into politics. And when you join, just make sure that you are not you are not expecting a perfect world. So a lot, I, I have encountered many young people, they get very disillusioned when they join, uh, because when they, when they, when they are in politics, they, they, outside all, they see, wow, this party is perfect, la, they really do everything. Then you realize inside, oh, so messy everywhere, so messy at this and that. Actually, we really live in a very real world. So set your expectation low. Things are not perfect, mm -hmm. that's why you join. You just- believe. Absolutely. Things are fantastic. Not, if it is perfect, you don't join, okay? So things are <laughs> perfect. That's why I join. I want to make a change. So, so well said, YB. Well yeah. said, YB. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us and for all those excellent insights into leadership, sustainable development goals, as well as the need to always, always think about the environment serve with merit and also serve with integrity. We hope all of you have been taking notes. I think YB gave some, you know, invaluable tips that you're not going to be able to hear anywhere else. YB, you'll be in. Thank you so much for being our closing keynote speaker for the NSGA Global Leadership Camp 2021. With that, I'm Tamina Kalji, handing over back to our MC, Arisha. Thank you once again, YB. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Ms. Tamina. Um, uh, on behalf of MSGA, we would like to extend our sincere gratitude and appreciation to our closing keynote speaker, YB Yobi Yin, and again, our moderator, Ms. Tamina, uh, for the extremely informative session. And in general, just empowering our Malaysian student leaders from over the world that are here today. So, um, before we leave, uh, I would like to take a, a photography session with uh, our fellow speaker and our fellow moderator. So sure. I'm gonna take a picture in, okay, one, two, three. All right, I'm gonna take right. a gallery view as well because I uh, do not mind. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, I think that. Uh, all right, thank you so much. Uh, again, YB Yogi and Mr. Mina, we hope to see you guys again in uh, 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 our future MSGA events. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mina. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you YB. so much. Bye, YB. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. All right. Okay, I hope all of our dear participants uh, today did enjoy our closing keynote speaker, which is YB Yobi Yin. Uh, so we are going to begin our awaited closing ceremony. Uh, so I will start to begin our closing ceremony. We will start by recognizing the award winners for MSGA's third edition of Global Excellence Award. Global Excellence Award is a part of MSJ's initiative to rec recognize student leaders for their outstanding performance and achievements in their respective field. Our Member Council of the Year Aspiring Award goes to National Assembly of Malaysian Students in America, NAMSA. Please welcome a representative from NAMSA, Adil Nordin, to give his speech. Thank you so much, um, MSDA, for the Member Council of the Year Aspiring Award. Um, NAMSA is very proud and honored to receive this prestigious award from MSDA. As a, as a Member Council of MSDA, NAMSA will keep on working hard in service of Malaysian students in the United States. Once again, on behalf of NAMSA, thank you very much. Thank you, Adil. Uh, I will move on to the next award. Our next award, the Digital Excellence Award, goes to International Business Society, IBIS UITM Puncha Alam. Please welcome Afika Aizul on behalf of IBIS to give a speech. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon to everyone. I'm Afika Aizul on behalf of IBIS. First and foremost, I would like to thank MSGA for giving us the opportunity to prove and show to the world that our effort of hosting all of these 21 events throughout the semester were not in vain. And then there is a sudden pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. This award has become a moral boost for IBs to push forward and create more amazing and insightful events in the future. Second and most importantly, I would like to thank each and every single one of my team who are involved uh, with these, uh, this project. So to Leah, Sophia, Lisa, Fatin, Gina, Sarah, Dina, and Rajdan, you guys with your perseverance, especially during these very busy and hectic weeks with deadlines and finals coming up from the bottom of my heart. I thank every single one of you. Thank you so much for trusting in me to lead this team and thank you for believing in our team. And next to Puan Jennifer Saidon, our advisor, thank you so much for your support, for always backing us up, for staying by our side, for being our mother and our motivator and the reason why we have the strength for John. And finally, to IBIS, we know it is not easy to get to where we are today, the number of obstacles we face, the critics we endure, and the rejections we receive. So people call us crazy for doing what we do, but this award here shows that we can overcome anything, and we can rise to the top. We are IBIS, and we are always will be above you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Afrika, for that speech. Uh, okay, we're gonna move on to our next award. Uh, Academic Excellence Award goes to Lee Jung Shin. Uh, go ahead, Lee Jung Shin, uh, and give us your speech. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Lee Jung Shin, fifth year medical student from UKM. First of all, I'm honored to have won this Academic Excellence Award of the GEA. 
actually it's not just about being taught in academia, but more importantly, I believe that it must be translated into sustainable leadership with a holistic vision and the ability to practice social and corporate responsibilities that can profit our community and nation at large. Lastly, this award serves as a platform for me to cooperate and strive harder with other global young talents for the betterment of the world. Once again, thank you to the organizing committee of this esteemed camp. And with that, thank you and stay safe, everyone. Thank you so much, Lee Jungshin, for that inspiring speech. Uh, I will move on to the next award. The next award, a uh, Young Leader Award, goes to Ng Yuk Xiang. Please welcome Ng Yuk Xiang. Hello, everyone. I'm Xiang, currently a fourth year dental student at University Science Malaysia. First of all, it's truthfully such an honor for me to be receiving this Young Leaders Award from Malaysian Student Global Alliance. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank those who have been helping me out uh, to reach a stage where I can proudly hold out this award as a mark of my achievements today. And before I end my speech, I'd like to share with all of you that the sky is the only limit, so never let anyone or anything stops you from reaching a goal or making your dream happen. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. I'm not sure Ng Yuk Xiang is here today, but I'm pretty sure uh, his uh, speech and quote did inspire all of you. Uh, all right, last but not least, our Nation Building Award goes to Dania Maisara Binti Helmi. Please welcome Dania and uh, give us your speech. Thank you, Arisha. Thank you, MSGA, for inviting me to this GLC and also hosting this GEA. Shout out to Arisha for reaching out to me. I'm so, so honored um, to be receiving this Nation Building Award. My accomplishment is not something I did alone. The team Time to Talk 2020 deserves a share in this as well. I would also like to give a quick shout out to my family and friends for their endless love and support. Thank you and have a nice day. Back to you, Arisha. Thank you so much, Dania. Uh, I do appreciate the shout out <laughs> very much. All right. Now, the moment that we all have been waiting for. Um, but before that, first of all, MSGA would love uh, to applaud all of our participants for participating in our pitching competition and all of our judges for also making time to judge our future Malaysian leaders. Without further ado, the third place winner goes to group two. Congratulations, uh, group uh, members of group two, I see I lead. Okay, before we move on to the next, I would like uh, to take a picture uh, for with all of you. We are gonna spotlight you guys for a moment. All right, is everybody here, group two? Great. All right. Okay. Let's take a picture. One, two, three. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Congratulations again. Okay. We're going to move on. The second place winner goes to group 14. All right. Where are our group 14 members? Go ahead, group 14. Post, please, spotlight. Is it only two people? Am I only seeing two people? Yeah. All right, is all of the members here? Oh, three, wow. Congratulations, all of you. Okay, we're gonna take a picture. All right, one, two, three. Thank you so much, Amira, Alia, and Si Chong. And congratulations to all, all of you again. Okay. Again, I think this is the moment, the actual moment all of you have been waiting for, the grand prize winner. I'm going to uh, uh, tell you guys again, the first winner is winning a thousand Ringgit Malaysia and obviously uh, plus the e-certificate uh, in addition to your certificate of participation. 
All right, the grand prize winner of Malaysian Students Global Alliance Global Leadership Camps Pitching Competition goes to, bring the drum, switch the slide, let's see, let's reveal. Group six. Wow, congratulations, group six. All right. We see all, all the members are here. Are all of you here? Okay, are all of you here? Can I get confirmation? Yes, all of you are here? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, one member couldn't make it today. So, yeah, this is. Okay, yeah. that's okay too. All right, we're going to take a picture, okay? Get our winners. Get one. Two, three. All right, congratulations to group six for the amazing presentation. All right, again, um, to those who also did not win, we are still very appreciative and we are still uh, very, again, thankful for participating in our pitching competition. Uh, I would also like to say you're all winners in all of our hearts. All right, okay, okay, congratulations to all Global Excellence Awards and Pitching Competition winners. Okay, lastly, before we leave, let's have a photography session. Uh, okay, okay uh, to everyone, please turn on your cameras. Okay. All right, is everybody ready? Okay, I'm gonna take picture of slide one, okay? Okay, one, two, three. All right, next slide. Okay, one, two, three. Third one. One, two, three. Great. And lastly, one, two, three. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone. So thank you so much for joining us on day two of Global Leadership Camp and, uh, and day one as well. Uh, so uh, please do, sorry. So uh, tomorrow, Tomorrow, uh, we will be sending out the feedback form and we will be sending it out uh, via email and WhatsApp. So for the ones that are in the group right now, uh, please don't leave yet <laughs> until you receive the feedback form. Uh, uh, it is important as you will only earn your certificate of participation after you have submitted those forms. All right, thank you again for everybody uh, for joining us for throughout the Global Leadership Camp 2021 and make it a success. Uh, and everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day ahead. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you organizer. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much, everyone, Bye. for joining. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you everyone. See you, everyone. See you guys in summit. <laughs> yeah, please join for MSJ Summit, guys. It'll be on the 28th, 29th yep. August. Summit, uh, summit. Uh, okay, too late already. Uh, 55 people later. I forgot. It's okay. It's all good, all good, all good. They'll be seeing our Instagram anyway. Yeah. Wait, we just Emails email them. Email, email. Yeah, email, yeah. Keep an eye out for Summit. Bye, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you and congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.